It is good to see y'all here this morning. Let's stand together as we begin to worship our Lord. take a minute for prayer. Lord, we do thank you for your amazing love to us today. And today, as we do kind of just focus in on your love, Lord, I pray that you will help us. Help us to recognize what an amazing gift that is. And Lord, help us to just, in gratitude, offer our lives, ourselves, back to you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Um, Just a few announcements for this week. Um, There will be a new opportunity starting. That will be starting on November 20th, and that will be a book club. That will be on Sunday evenings. It's an Advent study. So um, if you are interested in that, there is a sign-up sheet in Jewel Hall, and uh, Gloria Van Burgle has more answers um, if you have more questions. And then next Sunday, this is one that most of us like to hear. Remember, next Sunday is the time to set your uh, uh, clocks back an hour, so be ready for that one. And then also, um, November 12th, we are having a craft activity here at the church. That's from 10 to 2 on that Saturday. It will be down in the Fellowship Hall. Um, It's about mixes uh, mixes in jars and ornament making, and Deb Lockwood has all the answers to that for all your questions, so check with her on that. Our scripture lesson this morning is from Romans 5. And and as we look at the scripture and as we sing the songs today, um, I would encourage you to try to look at them with new awe. One of the advantages of growing up in the church, being in the church for a long time, is we know this stuff. We know the truth. We know of God's amazing love for us. But the problem with growing up in the church, being in the church for a long time, is we get used to it. And we just take it for granted. What if you heard this for the first time? You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. 
Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In just a moment, we're going to be singing the song, The Wonder of It All, and, and we're going to close it um, by doing the, the chorus a cappella again. But I encourage you, as you sing through it, again, to just try and imagine this is the first time you've heard this, or at, make the words real to you. And especially as we sing it a cappella at the end, that's just a chance to lift that up as an offering to God and say thank you for the amazing love that he shows us. Let's stand together as we sing his praise. thank you for that amazing love and it is hard to imagine that the creator and sustainer of the universe the one who simply spoke and everything came into being not only knows who I am but actually loves me that he loves each one of us here that he is here with us this morning and he's waiting for our praise and he's waiting for our worship Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for that amazing love. And Lord, I thank you for the way that you show that love to us each and every day, the way you walk with us through the challenges that we face. And Lord, we do lift up several from our church who are having difficult physical challenges right now and battling cancer and other challenges. Lord, I just pray that you will be with them, that you will continue to give them an assurance of your presence. We pray for their healing. And Lord, we just pray that your love will surround them. And Lord, you've promised that you will never leave nor forsake us. And Lord, I thank you for that promise and we cling to that promise today. And Lord, we just pray that in all that we do, they will give you glory and honor. We ask this in your name. Amen.
may be seated, and if the ushers would come forward and wait upon us for the tithes and offerings. So, can you tell them what this song is called? Ten Thousand Reasons. Reasons. And why did, you, why did you want to sing this song, Blaze? Because it reminds me of God. That's a good thing. How about you, Jazzy? Why did you want to sing this song? Because I really know it, and my, my mom and dad teach me it. Kingston, do you know why you sing this song? <laughs> <laughs>
I enjoyed listening to the music. I also enjoyed watching y'all listen to the music. That was fun. It, it proves we can smile in church because that was fun. Um, we've been looking in the book of Acts and the amazing things that God has been doing there. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost. And this was the first time that the Spirit had fallen on a large group of people like this. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come on certain people, usually for a certain amount of time, but usually not a whole group, and he wouldn't stay there. But this, so this was a historic occasion, and the way God did it, with the sound of the rushing wind and the people talking in other languages and everything, it got people's attention. And when Peter saw the crowd there, he started preaching. And we know that 3,000 people came to Christ then. But then um, in chapter 3, Peter and John healed the crippled beggar. And this guy was well known in Jerusalem. And so that got people's attention. And a crowd gathered again. And once again, Peter started to preach. And like 2,000 more became Christians. So these are huge events. And you can see what the church is doing at these great and glorious gatherings together. But smushed in between, smushed, it's a technical term, smushed in between those two big passages, there's a little six-verse snippet that tells us a little bit about what the Christians were doing on a day-to-day basis. And I think there's some things that we can learn there. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and their goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now this was a special time. It talks about the people meeting together every day and worshiping together every day. This was a special time. And it doesn't look like the early church even maintained, was able to maintain this intensity for a long term. So I'm not saying that everything that they're talking about here that we should be doing 365 days a year. But there are some principles that can teach us a lot. One, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That was to the study of the word. They wanted to know more. These were new Christians, and they wanted to find out as much as they could. And so they were studying the word. They were listening to the sermons. They were going to the book club. They were uh, going to Bible study. They were going to Sunday school class. They wanted to learn as much as they could. And so they devoted themselves to learning. And if we really want to learn something, it will show in our behavior. And if we think, well, that'd be nice, but, you know, it's not that important, that will show too. You know, it, every so often I, I, I get to thinking that my classical education is not all it should have been. You know, and it's usually when I'm watching Jeopardy. Because Jeopardy, they ask, they have a few favorite books and a favorite play. If they ask, totally not in the notes, if they ask anything about a play that you don't know the answer to, say Death of a Salesman. It hits about a third of the time. But anyway, they have a few books that they really like and stuff, too. To Kill a Mockingbird is one they talk about a lot. Moby Dick is another one. And Moby Dick, it's mentioned, that's even mentioned in Star Trek. You know, and I realize, I, I see all these references to it, and I've never read it. And I thought, you know, I should read that. I should learn. And so a while ago, I, I got the book out. Because, I mean, I know there's a white whale involved. I know the captain has forgiveness issues and that sort of thing. But that's about all I knew. And so I started the book. And I learned that the dude's name was Ishmael. That's about as far as I got. I read the first chapter. And for those of you who really like the book, I'm not trying to be offensive or anything, it just did not resonate with me. The phraseology, the way they wrote it, I, I, I'm trying to read it, and it's like, oh, man, no. You know, and I decided 
I can live with my ignorance. You know, I'll wait for the movie. You know, that sort of thing. And the problem is a lot of people t- treat God and the Bible that way. You know, it's like, well, I should learn some more. I, I know I should study. I should learn what God has for me, but I'm just not going to take the time right now. But these folks devoted themselves to the study, to the teaching, so they could learn and they could grow. The same principles apply for us. And they devoted themselves to worshiping together. That's when it talks about the fellowship of the believers. That was actually worshiping together is what they were referencing there. And these guys were worshiping together every day. I Just let that one sink in for a minute. They were doing it every day. That takes intentionality. Even if we just think of Sunday as our primary day of worship, it takes intentionality to come together on Sunday because there are so many other things that can pull us away. I mean... There are always festivals going on. There's always some sort of festival. Some small town is trying to get your business every single weekend, you know? And there are festivals and there are tournaments and there are sports activities and all these different things. One of the, one of the biggest dangers to church is beautiful weather. You know, I, I do kind of like it when it rains on Sunday, Sunday morning. Let it rain. That, that's good because beautiful weather and campers. I mean, Camp, camping is fun. I love camping. I am always scared when I hear someone from the church go, we just got a new camper, because it's like, shoot, we're not going to see him all summer, you know? And that, is, that happens far too often and far too easily. There are so many things that can pull us away. Then there's the family get-togethers and the things that we have to do there. And then, of course, there's always the, well, I have to rest sometime. Because, you know, it's my only day to sleep in. Let's face it, all that time that we've been spending with the in-laws is exhausting. And Sunday is supposed to be a day of rest. So, got to do it sometime. It takes intentionality to come together to worship. But when we come together, there is a power in the synergy of our worship. And I love where the scripture says where two or more are gathered in my name. I am in the midst of them. Just to think that God is here. That's an awesome privilege that we have. They devoted themselves to worshiping God. And they devoted themselves to prayer. This stuff is not rocket science. You know, we know this. I mean, you ask any kid in Sunday school, the first answer they'll give for any question is Jesus. Um, the second one will usually be the Bible, and like the, by the time we get to the third one, it's prayer. I mean, we know prayer is important. But how often do we believe that? David's testimony last week convicted me when he was telling about Kids Jam and the challenges we've been having and then how he started sharing the prayer request with the small group who have been meeting together during Kids Jam to pray for the ministry, and how he started sharing specific needs and the kids that needed this and, you know, asking that God would work in their lives in this particular way, and how he started to see a change almost immediately. And it's a little embarrassing, but I was kind of surprised. We know that's the way it's supposed to work, but how often do we really expect it to work that way? You know, David gave that testimony on Sunday. Monday morning, we had a, a district pastors meeting up in Cadillac, and we were supposed to share what's going on in our churches. And so I shared that I learned something new in church. I learned that prayer works, you know? And the other pastor seated around the table said something along the lines of, you've been a pastor for over 30 years, you're supposed to know that, you know? And we do, but, but, (laughs) far too often our prayer just becomes routine. 
We have our prayer list. We're going to work down it. Da, 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 da. We pray for them, 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 them. Oh, yeah, this, this, this. Oh, forgot that one. Go back and get that, you know, the niece or nephew we forgot. Got to cover them quick and, you know. And we say a bunch of words and we don't think a whole lot about it and we don't mean a whole lot about it. We just do it because we're supposed to. But when they devoted themselves to prayer, things happened. And they devoted themselves to unity within the body, to fellowship, not just at church, but fellowship with other Christians. It says that daily they were meeting together to worship, to share meals with each other. Daily they were going into each other's homes and eating together. Daily they were getting together to play Trivial Pursuit. Daily they were getting together to watch football games. And, And of course, no, those last two are not in there. But it is the basic principle. On a regular basis, they were getting together with other Christians. And that is critical because the people that we spend the most time with are the ones that will have the biggest impact on us. And if we want to have a closeness with the people that we worship with, the five minutes before and after service really is not enough. We need to spend more time with them because we are impacted by the people around us and we have an impact on those that we see. I mean, you just think about it. Some people you thought you'd always be close to, right? You'd always have a special connection. You think kids, when when they're down this size, you know, if they are blessed, if they've got good families and they're, they're fortunate enough to be around family and all that sort of thing, they tend to spend a lot of time with cousins, right? And that's fun. And when you're a kid, you think that's never going to end. I mean, it's, it's always going to be that way. Your cousins are always going to be your best friends. And yay, this is great. It's always going to be this way. It's not. At least it hasn't been in my family. Life happens. You grow up. And you get spread out. And you don't see them near as often. And there's still a special connection. But let's face it. If you're like me, I've got first cousins that if I saw walking down the street, I would not recognize them. I mean, last summer, this summer, we were over at the fair. Okay, I was getting an elephant ear again. But we were over at the fair, you know, and I glanced over and at the, I think it was the hot dog concession. I don't know. I don't go there. I just go to the elephant ears. At the hot dog concession, there was a guy that looked really familiar. He looked a lot like my uncle. And I thought, oh, I bet that's my cousin. And so I said to Cindy, is that him? And we both looked at him. I think so. I don't know. He lives 15 miles away, and I haven't seen him in years. Anybody else relate to that sort of thing? Finally went up, said his name. He turned and he smiled and said, oh, yeah, that's who it is. (laughs) Yeah, no question. Yeah. We thought we'd always had that special relationship with our cousins, and it is still great to see them. What, once we recognized each other, we ended up sitting down and just you know, had a blast talking for a few minutes. It was good. But realistically, we are closer to the people at work than we are with a lot of our own family members. And that's simply because we spend more time with them. If we want to have closeness to the people that we worship with, then we need to spend some time with them. And there's lots of different ways we can do that. Some of the ways are already preset. You can join the book club. You can join a Sunday school class. You can come to the senior potlucks. These are all just different ways that you can spend some time with each other, worshiping, or I mean, just fellowshipping together. But then also, if you feel the need for more connection, You can be the change agent. You can be the one that starts to bring that connection. It's so easy to sit back and say, well, nobody invited me out or anything, you know. Are we inviting anyone? Well, we can just call them up and we can invite, you know, invite a few friends over for a game night. Um, Invite them over for a football party. We had fun last night. 
um, go, watching the game with a few friends, and that that it was a good game. Um, I, and <laughs> um, I, I know I told Cindy the hardest part for me today is to not gloat, but it was a good game last night, right? Um, and actually, for state, it was. It it was supposed to be a blowout, and it wasn't. But anyway, um, you know, just simple things like that. Inviting somebody to go out for a cup of coffee. These are just simple things that we can do to increase the time that we spend with the people that we want to be close to, to feel the connection with. And then in the scripture, there's a passage here that we usually give quite a bit of press to, uh, quite a bit of attention to, where it says that they gave, they basically, they shared their possessions. Whoever needed more, the people that had would sell some of their possessions and give to those who needed it. And we talk about that a lot, but that's also hard for us, especially as Americans, to understand. Because that sounds almost like socialism there. And we can't understand that because we know God is a capitalist, right? I mean, that obviously, God is just like us, right? But God is not a capitalist. And I hope I don't offend anybody. God is not an American. And it is not our job to make God more like us. It is our job to become more like God. And if it makes you feel any better, they're not really talking about socialism here anyway. They're just talking about people helping people. They're talking about people who had some, a little more than they needed, who saw their friends hurting. And so they said, let me help you. It was just God's people letting God's love flow through them. And it showed that the people weren't going, it's all about me, it's not all about my taste, my desires, my choice, are you doing what I want? But it was all about we. How can we build one another up? And in all of this, they kept their focus on God. They continued to praise God. And it would have been so easy for them to just kind of get, get going with it, you know, and say, oh, wow, things are going so great and all this, and I'm having such a good time with my friends, and kind of forget to even mention God in there. But they kept giving the praise to God and the people around them, the ones they still saw at work and things, they noticed. And it says the Lord was adding to their number daily as people saw what was going on. You know, the way they were living, meeting together, worshiping together, eating together daily, that, that's hard to sustain. It really is. I mean, when I read this, I think of family camp. That, that, that speaks family camp to me. Because, I mean, when people come together and they are worshiping every day and they are studying every day and they are praying every day and they're sharing fellowship with each other every day, I mean, that's family camp, Right? But we can't live at family camp. Well, at least until you're retired. Once you're retired, then you can go down to Lakeland, and it, it's close down there from what I understand, kind of live at family camp. But um, most of us don't have that opportunity. You can't live at camp because you have to come home. If nothing else, you have to you know, do some work and earn some money for those who need it, like the bank that holds your mortgage, you know, because they always seem to need more money. And... You have, to, you have to do life. But when these people chose to focus on God, when they chose to study God's word, to worship together, <coughs> and to pray together, excuse me, then God did amazing things through them. That's the same God we still serve. And those same principles still apply today. Let's stand together for prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the way that you work in our lives. And I thank you for these examples that we have from Scripture. Lord, I pray that we will learn from them. And Lord, help us to keep our focus on you and to develop into the people that you want us to be. We ask this in your name. Amen.
bless you and keep you throughout the week. Uh, you are dismissed.